Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. This is Nick Pope, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal network. And this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. Hello, and welcome to the show. Thank you for that intro, Nick. Okay, now, most of you will be aware that I um, organised the Colonel Holt Returns to Woodbridge conference last Sunday, uh, Sunday the 8th of September. Um, it was very successful, as I understand. Everyone's been saying how, how much they enjoyed it. Um, I'm still amazed how well it went. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it was a lot of hard work and, um, it went down well. So that's all I can say about it, really. Um, but, um, before I go into the, the, the um, interview with Colonel Holt, I'll just tell you that I've recorded this bit separately to the actual interview. I interviewed Colonel Holt just before he flew home. Uh, in my lounge, uh, or actually in my, my study actually, um, and th- where he was situated on the mic, it's, it, he comes through a lot clearer than I do, but he's got the most, um, uh, obviously his voice is more important than mine, so he's the one that you, you'll be listening to uh, more than mine. Uh, but uh, before we go into that, uh, I was just going to give a few call outs to people, uh, people that actually attended the conference and um, made some very kind and uh, kind comments about it. Um, Fiona and Nick Malone came from Leyston in Suffolk. Um, she made some very nice comments. Uh, when Rosenbaum, she's sent me some lovely pictures. Um, uh, and and, um, and she says she enjoyed it. Uh, she, she's from Uxbridge, UK. And we've got Lisa Polo. Now, Lisa came in from Los Angeles, California. Um, her mother, um, Lorette, is actually making a film with Colonel Holt. Unfortunately, Lorette wasn't able to fly in because uh, she broke her ankle just before coming over. So, unfortunately, because of the foot in plaster, it would have been a bit awkward to come and do what, what she was intending to do and, uh, and fly in and everything, so she was advised not to. So, unfortunately... Um, she wasn't able to come. So, but we're, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be able to meet up next year some, at some point. Um, or maybe even before that. But, um, obviously it's, uh, but it was nice to speak to Lisa and she was, uh, very nice and she came out for a meal with us and everything. But anyway, right, I think we ought to get into this uh, interview with Colonel Holt, which I, I hope, I'm pretty sure you'll find very interesting. Uh, we cover a few subjects that, uh, we talked about, um, at the conference yesterday. Uh, well, I'm saying yesterday, the weekend, the last weekend when you hear this. <laughs> but uh, anyway, just before I go, I'll just say again that uh, my voice doesn't come out clearly on some parts of it, uh, the, more, more of the latter parts. But um, Colonel Holt's got the more, imp- uh, the more important stuff to, to listen to anyway. So I hope you enjoy this and uh, here we go. Anyway, well, as I was saying in the intro, welcome to the show, Colonel Holt, a uh, chuck. Well, uh, thank you. Oh. Uh, as I was saying about uh, the conference we've just done, uh, how did you feel it went? Well, I, I enjoyed it. There were some very nice people there, and they were it's a very receptive audience. They listened intently and had some very good questions and quite a few comments afterwards to me. Right. Now, I suppose what, what we should do is actually, if you don't <coughs> mind, I know, you, I know you've done this hundreds of times before, but perhaps you could go through... Um, what, what actually happened on, on your particular night, I suppose, or maybe the, even the entire incident, because there, there was a, a, it went over three nights, didn't it, the Rendlesham Forest incident, but your night was the third night. Well, I can tell you, actually, I, I got involved the first night in that, uh, as my role as the deputy base commander, I spent a lot of time on, out on the base, riding with police patrols, visiting the fire department, midnight chow, finance, personnel, you name it, I was there looking around 
uh, it's my responsibility to know what was going on in the base and try and head off any problems before they became an issue. So as a result of that, I spent a lot of time visiting with the police especially because they seem to seem to know more about anything on the base than anybody. Early on the morning of December 26th, that would have been Boxing Day for you all, I stopped by the police station to pick up the police blotters, the police blotters being the chronological listing of everything the police had had involvement in for the previous 24 hours. And when I walked into the building, uh, the desk sergeant looked up, and he started to laugh. And uh, it kind of puzzled me because here's a guy that's been working all night long, and, you know, to, to laugh early in the morning, most of them are in a hurry to get home or whatever. And uh, he was laughing, and I said, well, what's so funny? He said, Colonel, you're not going to believe this. Last night, Burroughs, Penniston, and Cabana Sack were out in the woods chasing UFOs all night, and the lieutenant, who was a senior police officer on duty, said, don't put anything in the police blotters. At first, I thought it was a joke. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, I said, I'm serious. I said, well, what do you know? He said, well, sometime after midnight, uh, our patrol at Woodbridge, now let me explain. <clears throat> Our police have two career fields, law enforcement and security. Law enforcement, uh, the people working law enforcement are policemen like most people come in contact with. They drive a patrol car, they write citations to people that drive too fast or whatever, they investigate crime, domestics, anything an ordinary police would do. They wear a blue uniform, they carry a thirty eight revolver, they did in those days, a nice stick and a radio and a few other things, handcuffs and whatnot. Then on the other hand, the security people, they're trained entirely different. Their job is air-based ground defense and defense of the aircraft and the weapons. So they wear camouflage fatigues. They carry automatic weapons, M16 in this particular case. So on the base, we had different patrols. The security people were divided up into flights, four flights, A, B, C, and D. They worked shifts, and they rotated the shifts. The law enforcement people did something similar. When they didn't work as long a shift, and uh, their work was, like I say, a little different. They, they had a patrolman at the gate, and they did the other patrolling. Law enforcement had a senior NCO, normally a tech or a master sergeant, who was police one for each shift, and a lieutenant who was the on-duty senior officer. And then they would have police two and police three who patrolled Buttwaters. Police four and five patrolled Woodbridge. So, with that being said, Police 4, who at that time was John Burroughs, went up to the back gate. The back gate was a shortcut between the two bases. Uh, it was over primary roads and through the countryside, but it didn't involve driving way out around and back to get to the front gate at Woodbridge. We had to check the gate regularly because what would happen is we didn't man it 24 hours a day. We only manned it when there was an exercise or something was going on some heavy maintenance activity. So what would happen is the maintenance people would learn the combination of the gate, and they didn't always close the gate. So we couldn't have an insecure gate. So the checklist for police four or five included going up to the gate every so often, every hour or two, and checking the integrity of the lock and make sure it was secure. Burroughs goes up to the back gate somewhere after midnight. The back gate is secure, by the way. But looking out into the forest, at that time, the road out from the east gate to the Forest Service Road had a low scrub. You could see all the way out to the Forest Service Road and even beyond because there was a huge field out there, too. You could almost see to the coast through the tall Corsica pines because the, the, the crimes of the tree were high. The canopy was up there, but you could walk underneath very easily. He looks out and he sees something out there, something unusual. And it wasn't the lighthouse. We were all familiar with the lighthouse. The lighthouse had always been a was kind of a beacon to us. He sees what appears to be a downed aircraft. He sees multicolored lights, and there's something on the ground or down near the ground. So he gets his partner to come up, Police 5, and it, Bud Steffens. He comes up, and the two of them look, and they agree there's something out there. Well, they don't know what to do, so Burroughs goes back to the guard shack. He doesn't want to put it on the radio because too many people have scanners, and he doesn't want to cause a lot of panic or a lot of confusion or excitement, and calls the desk sergeant, says there's something out in the forest that appears to be a downed aircraft. So the desk sergeant, who I talked to earlier, 
calls air traffic control tower and says, do you guys see anything? Is there any report of crashed aircraft? No, no, nothing's flying. We don't have anything in the area. He calls Eastern Radar, RF Watersham, who is responsible for that area for air traffic control. And they say the same thing. No, nothing going on. All's quiet. He even calls Heathrow Tire, and they say, nope, the only thing we show is two tracks coming in from the States, and they're over the English Channel. Well, this is really puzzling. Meantime, Sergeant Penniston, who's security supervisor, remember security, the difference, comes up to the gate, and another patrol comes up to the gate, and they all look out and they see something. There's definitely something out there. So, Master Sergeant J.D. Chandler, who's the senior NCO on duty, also comes up to the gate. So it's decided to go check, see what it was, investigate. So they check their weapons at the gate because we don't take weapons off the base. And Penniston, the senior NCO, Burroughs, and Airman Cabanasak, who was a new recruit, well, a new recruit, he had only been on the base for a few days or a week, jump in a six-passenger pickup truck, four-wheel drive, head out the East Gate Road, they hit the Forest Service Road, they turn right, in about 200 yards, they turn down a, a rough trail into the forest. They go so far in and uh, they decide to stop. They're having problems with their radios, having communication problems. The radios are breaking up, which is very unusual. These are 5-watt Motorola radios and very reliable. So they leave Cabana Sack somewhere near the vehicle to act as a radio relay. This isn't normally necessary because we have repeaters all over the base. And they venture into the woods. And uh, exactly what happens from then on for the rest of the evening, nobody's really sure. There's a whole lot of stories, and I know Jim Pennison has talked about it earlier, so I'm not going to cover that. Uh, I will mention that the, there were some issues that they lost contact with the gate people, the folks left behind at the gate for at least 45 minutes, maybe longer. And there was some issues with the watches that apparently stopped. They come back with a wild tale. I say wild tale because it's very hard to believe what they came back and said. So, I pick up the blotters. I kind of laugh a little bit. I had them put an entry in there or something to the effect that they saw some lights and investigated, but they didn't find a crashed aircraft, something to that effect. I don't think the term, as I remember, UFO was used anywhere. I take the blotters up to the base office, our office, and we have our morning stand-up meeting. Now, the morning stand-up meeting was basically the wing commander, vice commander, the base commander, and a couple of the other senior officers. We'd get together every morning, somewhere between 7 and 7.30, and go over the previous day's activities, discuss what was going to happen the, the, for that day, and anything else of great importance that was going on in the base. Well, everybody had read the entry in the blotter, and they were asking some questions, and we kind of joked about a UFO, and, uh, not really thinking that much about it. Well, the day passed, and I realized as I went around the base that the cops were all excited. The grapevine had it. We had a UFO crash and this, that, and the next thing. And it uh, worried me a little bit because everybody seemed to be looking at the sky. The next day was uneventful as far as I knew, and the next night, although I learned years later that the on-duty flight chief, uh, new lieutenant Bonnie Tamplin, had some type of an encounter and saw an issue or something in the forest went out and had some kind of a, how should I say, frightening experience. We know she got on the radio and called for help. Uh, I didn't learn this all until later. And she was medevaced out within a matter of a day or two. So that was the second night. The third night, which would have been the first night, remember, was the 25th to the 26th, second night, 26th to 27th, and the night I was out, the 27th to the 28th. It started at a party. The combat support group, that's all the senior officers and all, you know, even the junior officers that work for the combat support group, it's 42 or 43 of them, we all got together with our significant others and had sort of a year-end party, celebration, recognition dinner uh, at the Woody Bar. The Woody Bar was an old World War II concert hut that had been a bar. It was really used, just used as an overflow for the officers' club for any event we had that didn't require or couldn't get into the officers' club or didn't have a large group. So we had gathered there. It was a covered dish dinner, as I said. Uh, I think we bought the ham and turkey, and everybody else brought dishes and desserts. We just finished eating, ready for dessert, when the on-duty flight lieutenant, lieutenant, 
came in and said, I need to talk to you and the base commander immediately. It was Lieutenant Bruce England. Now, Bruce England wasn't an ordinary lieutenant. Bruce England had been in the Marine Corps for four years, got out, finished college, got commissioned in the Air Force, and came in. He was pretty mature for a lieutenant. But he was definitely shaken. And he said to me, because I was sitting closer to the door when he came in, I need to talk to you and the base commander now, right away. So, so the only private place in there, other than the bathrooms, was the coat room. So we went into the coat room, just the three of us, and he said, it's back. He said, what's back? He said, the UFO is back. I said, what do, what do you mean? He said, well, we've seen something in the woods. There's funny lights. There's something out there. And I was quite concerned immediately, and it said something to the effect that you've been off the base again? He said, yes. So Conrad and I looked at each other, and it was decided that I would go out, since he was going to make some presentations and give a speech, and put this thing to rest, because we still had some serious thoughts and thought there was a logical explanation for what they were seeing. So I went to back to, into the room, contacted the security police commander, Mel Zickler, and said, who's your senior NCO on duty? Because I wanted a cop or two to go with me. And he said, Master Sergeant Bobby Ball. I said, great, I knew Sergeant Ball. Very competent individual. I said, have him come by the house and pick me up in about 30 minutes or so. I'm going to go home and change clothes. I'm not going to wear a nice suit out into the forest. Besides, it was about 30, 32 degrees, and the wind was blowing. It just wasn't the place to wear good clothes. I said to Conrad, I said, uh, Oh, I've got to take the car home. My wife's stuck here. He said, don't worry about it. I'll take her home. Okay. I then went to Sue Jones, Captain Sue Jones, who ran disaster preparedness. I said, who's your standby person? And she said, Monroe Nevels. Well, I knew Sergeant Nevels. He, uh, well, he was, wasn't the sharpest pencil in the box, but he was competent. He was a good photographer. I knew that. He often helped the base newspaper. So, and I knew he had a good camera. He had an, an Econ F2, and I had a pair of them too, and we both talked about common photography things from time to time when I saw him. So I said to Sue Jones, have him come down to the disaster preparedness office and meet us in 30 to 45 minutes after I've changed clothes and tidied up a little bit, and we'll, we'll go from there. Have him bring his camera. So I went home and changed clothes. Uh, Bobby Ball came by with a Jeep. Bruce England was driving, and there was another NCO in the back, and I learned later it was probably Sergeant Pastenza, but I'm not positive. We got in the Jeep, drove down to the disaster preparedness office, and we had to wait about 10 or 15 minutes because Sergeant Nevels wasn't there yet. The reason he wasn't there is that his wife was at a Catholic women's program at the chapel, and he was babysitting the kids. So the police had to go get her. Another patrolman went and got her from the chapel and took her to the house, and then Nevels put his utility uniform on and came down to the disaster preparedness office. He had his camera with him. I said, let's take a dagger kind of along so we can show there's no radiation. So he got a pair of them out and got a, a source, we called it, and calibrated them and said, which one should I take? And I said, hey, your pick, I don't care. <clears throat> so he got the Kai Gagger counter and we all piled in the Jeep. It was pretty crowded. It was an open CJ-5. Bruce England says, well, we're low on gas. We better stop at the gas station, the base gas station. So we stopped at the base gas station, and lo and behold, there's a couple of cops there with six passenger pickup trucks with light hauls behind them, and they're arguing with the fuel attendant. They're trying to tell him they won't run any gas, and he keeps telling them the gas is overflowing. Well, I kind of lost a little patience with him. So I said, come on, let's sort this out and get on. Well, they move on out. Apparently, they were going back out into the forest. We got gas. We crossed the base, went out the east gate, drove down the east gate road to the Forest Service Road, turned right, up the road about 150 or 200 yards, turned on this rough trail, and I mean a rough trail. If we hadn't had four-wheel drive in a high center, we wouldn't have made it. We drive down into the forest, mm, a quarter or a half mile, I'm not really sure. And I can see and hear the guys in the distance. We turn left on another side trail into the forest a bit. And lo and behold, there's something like 15 or maybe a few more policemen, a couple of light alls. And they're all milling around, making noise, trying to get the light alls to work. The light alls weren't working properly. They, they couldn't keep them running. And they were complaining. Now, light alls are pretty simple. It's a little gasoline engine and a generator and two big fluorescent lights that you can adjust. We use them for security and also for maintenance work at night. 
Well, I see all these people and I really get upset. I said, I'm thinking to myself, if we get caught out here in the forest, all of us with all this equipment, it'll be a public relations disaster. We'll never get done answering the mail and we'll all be embarrassed and it'll cause real problems for the base. So I tell them, all right, knock it all off. You guys be real quiet and stay right here and stay still. Don't make a lot of noise. We get out of the Jeep. Bruce England's brought a starlight scope, first generation uh, scope. And he says, look there into the forest. Out there is where something landed the first night. He apparently knew well where the site was. And I looked in there and I could see a bit of a dull glow, but nothing that I would get excited about. And I thought to myself and said something to the effect to him, so he said, let's go in and take a look. So myself, Lieutenant England, Master Sergeant Ball, Sergeant Nevels, and Sergeant Pestenza trape into the woods. They take me to this site. We look down and they show me three indentations about eight or nine feet apart, equal distance apart in a perfect triangle. And somebody's put a couple sticks in the ground for each one of them to mark them. It's very obvious. And I'm, hmm, this is interesting, but it still doesn't tell me a whole lot. So we number the sites, and we're walking around, and I had a measuring tape. We took measurements and uh, took some readings, and suddenly Neville says, I'm getting things. I'm getting readings. The three indentations had higher than background radiation, and the center of the triangle formed by the three indentations was significantly higher. Well, this is impressive. Well, not enough to be dangerous, but certainly significant. So let's try something. Let's go over to the trees here. And we notice there's marks on the trees, rub mark or burn marks on the trees. And so I said, take a reading on the side of the tree toward the indentations and take one on the back and see if there's a difference. Lo and behold, there is. You get much higher readings on the front side of the tree than we did on the back side. Then somebody said, look up, and you can see there's an equivalent of a hole in the tree canopy, and there's broken branches on the ground as though something had come up or down through the trees. Wow, this is starting to get interesting and started causing me a little bit of concern. We're probably milling around there for taking readings, etc. For I'm, I'm just going to guess 15, 20, 30 minutes, when suddenly somebody says in the party, hey, look out there, there's a glowing red object, reddish-orange object. We look out into the farmer's field, and, and guess what? There's this oblong, almost like an eye-shaped sh- object. It's glowing, it has a dark center, and it appears that something's dripping or shedding off it. I can't remember whether exactly sparks or drops, but something was coming off. What came to mind is when you a crucible of steel is poured into a mold, the splashing and whatnot. That's what it look, appeared to me like. We watch it for a couple minutes, and we're standing there in awe, and I'm thinking, that must be ball lightning. I've never seen it before. When the object actually moves into the forest, into the forest, it moves horizontally through the forest, bobbing up and down, avoiding trees, so it's obviously under some kind of intelligent control. This is amazing. I just can't believe what I'm seeing. I said, let's try and get close to it. So we try and move up close to it, and what does it do? It moves back out into the farmer's field. Now, while it's in the farmer's field glowing, we look at the farmhouse. In those days, you could see the upper and lower windows, two-story building. The reflection on the windows was so bright and like a flickering fire. I, I was thinking, ah, I'm concerned for the people in that building. That thing's close and it almost looks like it's on fire. We watch it for, I don't know, a minute or two. And suddenly, it silently explodes into five white objects, just like a fireworks display, and they disappear. Wow, so nobody's ever going to believe this. So I said to the other four, let's go out into the field and see if we can find any burn marks or any residue. Something was obviously coming off this object. So we go out into the field, and we don't find anything except cow pies. Uh, what I failed to mention is a little bit earlier when we first saw the object, the farm farmer's animals, the cows, etc., all went crazy making all kinds of noise and racket. But the farmhouse stayed dark. Nobody got up. Nobody turned any lights on. Anyhow, we're out in the field looking around, searching, and I believe it was Neville's, says, look up there. There's several stars. What appears, almost first I thought they were stars, then I realized they were elliptical shape, and they have multiple lights on, and they're moving in synchronization together, almost as though they're doing a grid search or doing some kind of a special pattern. 
We watch them for several minutes, and they from elliptical, they turn into full round. Sort of like like the whatever was shining light on them moved to a different location and, and revealed the whole object. And they're moving around together in sync. Wow. I said, let's move down further in the field past the farmer's house, see if we can get a better view of them. In the meantime, I'm talking to the command post saying, hey, we're seeing strange things in the sky, and I'm telling them, have the radar folks, that's the eastern radar, air traffic control people, look here and see what they see, and have the guys in the control tower look here and see what they see. And they keep telling me nobody sees anything. Well, I learned later on that wasn't true. Anyhow, we pass the farmer's house across a small dirt road, and we all stumble into a small stream and get wet up to our knees. And keep in mind, it's about 30 degrees. The wind's blowing. It's cold and miserable. We trudge on out across the farmer's field and or across the road from the farmer's house into a plowed field. And we go out in there probably 50, 75 yards. And we're looking up in the sky. And all of a sudden, somebody in the party says, look there to the south. Out over the sea, there's two bright whites in the sky. Now, this whole time, just about the whole time, we could see the lighthouse. So it wasn't the lighthouse. We know that. I was trying to think maybe the lighthouse was reflecting off something, but there was nothing up there to reflect off of. We watched these objects for several minutes, and one of the objects at very high speed comes directly overhead, and this is clearly stated on the tape. It stops directly overhead. Now it's up over a 1,000 to 2,000 feet, maybe a little higher. And we watch it for, I don't know, a very short period of time, and all of a sudden a focused beam comes down near our feet, less than 10 to 15 feet away. It's anywhere from 8, 10, 12, 15 inches in diameter. You can actually see the dust particles in the light. The light is concentrated. It's like a laser beam. We watch it for, I don't know, maybe a minute. And just as suddenly as it appeared, click, it went off, just like someone threw a switch. Well, by this time, I'm almost in shock. I can't, nobody's going to believe this. This is unbelievable. Why did I ever get involved in this? This is just too much. So... We watch for a few minutes, and the object recedes back to the south and back over Bentwater's base. There's two objects over Bentwater's base now, and we can hear the chatter. Between the five of us, we had three different radio frequencies. I was on the command net. In other words, I could talk directly to the command post. It's very limited, or only five or six of us could do that. Uh, Bistenza had a security net. He was on with the security police, and Master Sergeant Ball was stayed on the law enforcement net. So we had all three nets, and you could hear every transmission that was made on those three frequencies. And you could hear on the security frequency, the guys in the weapon storage area talking about seeing strange things and strange objects in the sky, and beams coming down in or near or in that area. Whoa. Well, it's getting on toward 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. The command host doesn't seem to care. Nobody seems to be getting excited. We're wet, tired, hungry, cold. I said, since nobody else is interested, let's pack it in and go back to the base. So we trudge back to base. But before we get to the base, we stop where the light alls were. Now, most of the cops had cleared out. There were still a couple left there. And there's Airman Burroughs there. He had hitched a rider, come out with one of the police patrols. And he'd been bugging me on the radio the whole time to come forward and join the five of us. And I kept telling him, just be quiet and stay where you are. Well, he's kind of getting on my nerves at this point. So he said, can I go forward to where the landing site was the first night? I said, if you go quickly and take Sergeant Pistenza with you. So the two of them went forward less than 100 yards to where supposedly where the landing site was from the first night. I, I could see them the whole time, although I wasn't watching them the whole time. They came back in a couple of minutes and didn't say anything then. But later they told me they had some kind of a confrontation. I had had some problems believing that, but I can't say they didn't. Well, we go back to the base. I go home. Everybody goes home. Uh, I take a shower, have a nibble to eat. I can't sleep. So I decide to go into the office. That's Finally, by then, it was about 7 o'clock. And this is a Sunday morning, so there's nobody in the office. So as I'm going up the steps into the office, we shared the building. The wing commander was on the left going in, and we were on the right, the base commander. As I was going in, the wing commander pulls in in a staff car. So I wait and hold the door for him. And he comes up the steps, and I can remember what he said. He says, Chuck, that was some kind of an experience you had last night, wasn't it? Because he'd been monitoring all my radio calls. I say, yes, it was. And I said, I even made a tape of some of it. He said, what? He said, come on in the office. 
So I went into an office with him. We sat down, and he said, play me the tape. So I played the tape. He listened intently. And when I finished the tape, he said, uh, give me the tape and the tape recorder. I said, what? He said, I want to take it to 3rd Air Force. That's Air Force headquarters in England at Milton Hall. Every Wednesday morning, the senior commanders, one from each base, came into the general's office, and they had a brief meeting there and went over things, something like we did on the base. He said, I'm going to play it for the general. And the first thing that went through my mind was, there goes my career. So I wait, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday, I was at the door waiting when he came back at noon from the staff meeting. And I actually, op- I remember, opened the door for him and said, well, boss, do I still have a job? He laughed and threw me the tape recorder. I said, what, what happened? He said, come on in. So I went into his office. He said, uh, well, I played the tape for the staff and the general. And I said, and? He said, the general looked at the staff and said, well, what do we do? Nobody spoke up. So the general, in his infinite wisdom, said, well, it happened off the base. It's a British affair. Case closed. Well, I felt a bit relieved then, but not completely. So I said to Colonel Williams, well, what do I do now? Anything? He said, get with Squadron Leader Mortem when he comes back and see what he wants to do. Squadron Leader Mortem was the RAF liaison officer on the base, but he wasn't there. He'd gone to his ancestral home on Anglesey Island for the Christmas holidays. So I had to wait until, I don't know, almost a week later. He came back. I went over and we sat down and I explained everything to him and he, so I could tell he was in shock. He didn't know what to do. He said, uh, let me check. So I bugged him a few times over the next few days. So three or four days or whatever later, he came to me and says, write me a memo so I can talk from it. Okay, I'll do that. So I went back to the office and wrote the infamous memo that's now been released. It was typed up on a select typewriter. We didn't have word processors yet. We were just talking about moving to them. And the only copy left in the office was a carbon manifold or a carbon paper. And it went missing somewhere along the line. I don't know where. But anyhow, I gave the memo to Don Moreland. But before I did, Conrad read it. He took it down to Gordon Williams' office. They both read it and brought it back to me. I gave it to Moreland with the understanding he was supposed to use it as a talking paper when he dealt with his people because I was sure somebody from MOD would come up to investigate and take over. Well, days turned into weeks, turned into months, and Don kept getting no answers. Actually, I was relieved. It's gone away. Thank goodness. I was so happy. Well, two years later, a young airman who had been booted out of the service and who, how can I say it, became a wannabe who put himself into the action at the, during the first three nights. And we know it's not true now, but nonetheless, went back to the States and started rattling to people there. And he ended up at a MUFON meeting. That's the UFO organization in the States. And somehow or other, he got connected up to Peter Robbins or excuse me, he got connected up to Barry Greenwood and Larry Fawcett. Those are the two authors of Clear Intent. Uh, Larry was the state director from UFON for his state, and Barry was one of the senior investigators. They wrote a book called Clear Intent. They wanted to do another book when they were working with Larry, and they contacted me. They came into the base with a freedom of information request for the memo and anything else we had. Well, we didn't have anything. It was all gone. So Jack Cochran, who was then the base commander, Ted Conrad had moved on, uh, went back and said, uh, we don't have anything. I'm sorry. There was an event, but there's no documentation here. And so they didn't give up easily. Larry Fawcett went to 3rd Air Force. And 3rd Air Force scrambled around, and they couldn't find anything either. However, the RAF liaison officer found out about it and said, oh, I've got a copy of my file somewhere. And he dug it out and gave it to them. Well, since they had the request, they were on or bound to respond. The acting commander, Pete Bent, called me on the phone and said, Chuck, I've got your copy of your memo here. And the first thing I said to him is, how did you get it? He said, well, the RAF liaison officer had a copy in his file. Then I realized Don Moreland had sent a copy to him, probably unbeknownst to me. Whoa, I said, 
burn it. He said, what? I said, burn it or your life and mine will never be the same. In other words, I wanted to do all I could to keep it from becoming public. He said, I can't. I have to release it. So he sent it back to Larry Fawcett and Barry Greenwood. Larry's since passed on, but Barry Greenwood can verify all this. Well, they shared it with some people. I think they sent it to either Harry Harris or Brenda Butler or Jenny Randalls. I'm not sure exactly who they sent it to. But I can tell you this. The second it hit the U.K., I had problems. I met BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, German TV, Japanese TV, Radio Orwell, and the list goes on. I had to go and literally go into hiding. I was swamped. And you thought it all gone away. <laughs> yeah, I thought it all gone away. And my comment to everybody was no comment. <laughs> I didn't want involved. So let's go back now and talk about the tape. I was going to ask you about that because uh, there's been some consternation about the length of the tape, hasn't there? Well. The, I made it on my little microset recorder, the same one I used every day. I walked when I went around to riding on the base. I always made notes in it and come back and give the tape to the secretary. And she had a regular machine, a dictaphone type machine, and she would type up the notes and we would use them at staff meeting or whatever was appropriate. So, Conrad said a few days after the event, "Make me a copy of that tape." Well, we didn't have any electronic capability, and they were just little micro cassettes. So I went in the conference room when it was quiet, laid both the tape recorders down, and made him a copy. I gave it to him and never thought any more about it. Well, he put it in the desk drawer and left it there, and I think he probably forgot about it, too. Several years later, Sam Morgan came along. Now, there's quite a story here with Sam Morgan. Sam Morgan and Gordon Williams had been went to get undergraduate pilot school training together and went to Vietnam together. In fact, there's some interesting stories there, but we're not going to go into all the details on that. Uh, Morgan didn't do too great in his career. He did manage to make colonel, but he needed a job, and he went to Williams, and Williams managed to get him sent to Bentwaters. They made him assistant DCM or some flunky job to, to, to put him in a holding pattern. Well, what happened? He had a son named Sammy. Sammy was a bit of a problem, and Sammy went through base housing and shot out, I don't remember, 50 or 100 windows with a BB gun. Sammy also stole the keys to the slot machines at the NCO club. He'd worked there part-time helping the janitor. And Sammy was in trouble. So the police came to me when they realized what was going on and said, what do we do? He's the colonel's son. We need to investigate or what? I said, you do what you normally do. So they went to Morgan's house and, how shall I say, interrogated her and talked to the son, Sammy. But the dad was there, and the dad was furious that they would come to his house with a gun and a badge in daylight. So he said, why are you here? And what did the cops tell him? Well, Holt said we could go there. Oh, okay. So I became number one on his hit list. Well, Conrad moved up and they needed a base commander. So Williams moved. Guess what? Sam Morgan up. But before he came, there was a period of time there of a couple of weeks. And Morgan was going around the base telling everybody first thing he was going to do was fire me. Well, I heard this. It got back to me from a dozen different sources. So I went looking for a job, and I actually found one in Germany. A very good friend of mine, who's now a retired general, was looking for a replacement for him, and he and I knew each other well. We'd gone to school, been stationed together a couple of times, and he was delighted to have me come replace him. <clears throat> so he went to his big boss, and his big boss, the general in Germany at 13th or 7th, 13th, whatever, numbered Air Force, called Dick Pasco, who was then the new wing commander and said, would you release Holt? I have a job for him. And Pasco said no. So that was that. Then Pasco called me into the office and said, what's going on? Why are you hunting for a job? I said, well, I need a job. Sam Morgan's going to fire me. And I can remember his exact words. He said, I'll fire him first. He said, don't worry about anything. So I didn't. But Sam Morgan and I had a very terse relationship after that. He never forgave me for what happened with his son. He found, he looked in the desk drawer and he found the tape. And he said to me, what's this all about? So I told him the story. Unbeknownst to me, he took that tape and played it at cocktail parties and other places just to berate me and make it look ridiculous. Somebody heard it and passed it on to several people in the British UFO business, the primary one being Harry Harris from Manchester. Well, Harry got the tape. Sam Morgan gave him a copy of the tape. Harry sold it to the Japanese people that were doing some UFO work for a small fortune, which he apparently shared some of, which was some of the other people involved. Anyhow, 
my tape was out there. Unbelievable. Here it is. My tape's out. My memo's out. This was all supposed to be quiet, and it hit the fan. I was furious, to be very honest with you, but there wasn't much I could do about it. So I was pretty much no comment to anybody that asked that I didn't know well. Well, I managed to get away with that for a long time. However, then I found out that Peter Robbins got into the scene. Now, Peter Robbins was a an art school graduate that didn't make it big time as an artist. He was teaching and whatnot and had a bit of an interest in UFOs. And somehow or other, he got connected up with Bud Hopkins, a very famous American painter. Bud was a fantastic guy, but he wasn't a very well-organized person. And Peter Robbins was extremely well-organized. And Peter Robbins came along, they became friends, and he did most of the administrative work for Bud Hopkins. Well, through Bud and his activities there, he ran into Larry Warren. And they got together and decided on a book. This is what caused all the issue. Left at the East Gate. It's all full of nonsense and lies and what do, I, what do you want to say? Uh, forgeries, etc. Nonetheless, the book sold well. So there I was, and I mentioned in the book, my memo's in the book, they talk about the tape, they put a transcript of the tape in there, so I'm stuck. So I decided I'll go for, come forward and tell the truth, which I did. The first thing that really happened to me, I was still on active duty, was I get a call from a producer in Hollywood, Unsolved Mysteries would like to do a special program with Robert Stack. Oh, well I'm working for the DODIG then, so... I go to my boss, the DODIG, and say, I've been approached by Unsolved Mysteries. They want to do a program, etc., etc. He said, what? Here. So we sat down, and I spent about an hour, an hour and a half explaining it all to him. I said, what do you think? He says, oh, go ahead and do it. Oh, here I am. I have the blessing from the DODIG. I mean, the guy that works right for the Secretary of Defense. All right. So I do the program. It turned out to be the highest rated program they ever did. And it, and it was replayed more times than any other program they've ever done. So there I am out there. So that's in essence what happened, and that's how it all came about. Yeah. Now let's go back to that tape again. There, there's been I've heard several reports that that tape was a lot longer than. The tape is not longer. The yeah. tape was the closest to ever having anything edited. Was one time I was playing the micro cassette for a friend at the house. Now, the little cassette was a linear, had a slide switch, on, off, record. And I was playing the tape for somebody when I bumped the, rec- the, the switch and it went up to record. And my daughter, who's a musician, was playing the piano. So there's a very short, I'd say, one or two second burst of piano music. That's the closest of any editing that's ever been done to the, the original tape. Now, that being said... I've been quoted as saying there's more tapes, there's this, there's that, the next thing. That probably came about because when I was working, I actually agreed to work with Barry Greenwood and, and Larry Fawcett if they stuck to the truth, trying to shut Warren up. And what happened was, Barry said, can you put more down? So I sat down, this was much later, and did a tape, a cassette tape, of everything I could remember of the event. And Barry Greenwood will verify. He probably still has the tape. That's the tape I was talking about when I said there's a tape with much more on it. It wasn't done that night. It was done two or three years later. So, and I still have copies of that tape somewhere. But it's and basically what I've just said. All the things I could remember plus a lot more, you know, the yeah. minute little details, etc. And Barry probably still has the tape. Hmm. Well, let's hope that clears that up for people that yeah. are still asking questions about the length of that tape. I, I don't, I don't, get, yeah, the, lot, it? yeah, I didn't leave the tape run the whole time because I was afraid of running out of batteries. And I don't remember whether I had spare batteries or not, but I, I would run out occasionally a battery or run out of tape. Yeah. So I only turned the tape recorder on when I wanted to say something or something was happening. That's yeah. the only times I turned the tape on. And like I say, the tape wasn't made to be released. The tape was made from my own notes and just, you know, what was going on. Yeah. What? Well, let's, let's move on to... Now, as you know, Jim Penniston's just brought out a new, a new book. I don't know, over the last three or four days, you've been reading the whole thing just about, haven't you? And you've gone through it. Now, I think you've got some issues with some of the things... Well, that, that book is the biggest disappointment I've seen in print in years. First, it starts off with saying, I went into the Air Force because I had an interest in UFOs. Friends, I never... Other than the fact that I had read a book one time when I was 12, 13, 14 years old 
uh, one of the original UFO books. It was I just came across it in a, at a rummage sale or the equivalent of a boot sale, as you call it here, and read it. And I just mentioned that because I did remember reading it, but I'd forgotten, long forgotten about it. And believe me, UFOs were the last thing in my mind when I came into the Air Force. I joined the Air Force to avoid the draft. Back in those days, there was a book called a military draft, and I was classified A1 and right on top of the list. So rather than being drafted and not have a choice of what I did, I went into the Air Force, was commissioned, and, and had a decent career, I guess is the best way to put it. Hmm. Uh, the other issues I have is uh, all the other senior officers that were involved and a whole lot of other people uh, were very irate that I spoke out. But, you know, none of them would come forward. Where were they whenever it hit the fan? Why did I write the memo? That memo that was released should have been written by Gordon Williams or Ted Conrad. But they chose not to. They did not want involved. And Gordon Williams hasn't been nasty. He and I kept touch through the years. He recently passed away. But Ted Conrad got very ugly, and he said ugly things. And, gosh, he's even reflecting on my performance but what I will say is, Ted, go back and read my report card, my efficiency report that you wrote. It's glowing and all the way up through a three-star endorsement. How does he think I got promoted? So, and then they talk about Nevels. Sergeant Nevels has suddenly decided that he was the one at the investigation, that he was going out to investigate, and I begged to come along with him. That's a bunch of BS. He went, he claims he was places he wasn't and did things he didn't do. It's just it's very frustrating to me that, and Jim knows better. I don't know why he puts such nonsense in the book. Uh, Conrad says, oh, yeah, that's true. Well, Conrad will say a lot of things. Conrad denies me going out in the yard and seeing things in the sky. Conrad knows a lot more than he's saying, uh, a lot of truthful things he's saying. Several years ago, John Burroughs ran into his son. He had a teenage son at the time at Bentwaters. And his son told him, well, my dad knows a whole lot more, but I can't tell you about it. It's interesting. Hmm. It gets even better. Uh, last year, Gordon Williams passed away right around Thanksgiving time, unfortunately. Uh, his adult daughter, Susan, and son, Art, two of his three children, met, were with him on his deathbed. And he told them several things. He said, I have a lot to get off my chest, and it had to do with the Bentwaters incident. And he had some words for me. Well, it took him four months. I bugged him for four months to finally we had a meeting. And Susan, uh, how shall I say, drank heavily. It was noon on Sunday. We met him at a little bar in Washington or a little pub. And uh, first thing they did was bring out a five-page non-disclosure statement that I would agree never to tell anybody what they told me. And very reluctantly, I signed it because I did want to know what Gordon Williams knew, even though I may not have been able to talk about it. I signed the document, and they gave me two words. In other words, encouragement, that's all. I can't tell you the two words because I did sign the agreement, but it basically was encouragement. Uh, they refused to say any more, which is really irritating. Obviously, I think they had planned originally to talk to me, but someone happened. Someone got to them or something happened. Something frightened them. I can't say what. I don't know. Interesting enough, they didn't hold the funeral right away because there were a lot of other activities going on apparently in the family and didn't hold the funeral and the reception till March. I got an email from Park Sims, who had been a wing exec for seven years at Bentwaters and was a good friend of mine. We had visited back and forth when I was here, or he and his wife were in the States. He said, are you going to the funeral? And I said, I didn't know about it. He said, well, I was thinking about coming from the U.K. to the States for the funeral. It was at Arlington Cemetery in Washington. He said, but all the expense of everything, the taxis and the hotel and everything. I said, Park, if you really want to go, I'll tell you what. Value your tickets. I'll pick you up at the plane. You come and stay with me at our house. We'll feed you and take care of you. He said, well, I want to visit some old friends. I said, I'll take you to visit your old friends, and I'll take you back. To, well, actually, my wife ended up doing it. I'll take you back to the airport. So your only expense will be to buy your airline ticket. He said, great. So he flew over. We picked him up and did just as we said. And the day before the funeral, he came a couple of days ahead. He said, you're going to the funeral, aren't you? I said, uh, I don't think I'd be welcome there. The, the kids didn't seem to be too receptive to me being around. He said, it's not their call. It's your call. I think you should go show respect to Gordon Williams. So I reluctantly agreed, and we went to the funeral. Uh, he was right. The, the children ignored me and gave me dirty looks. But lo and behold, his ex-wife, Marge, who had been at Bentwaters with him, 
was there. And she was very friendly. We talked to her. She had been a bit of a problem, at least for me, at Bentwaters, because she was so demanding and wanted so many things. But I realized later that the family was pretty dysfunctional, and she was under a lot of stress, probably. Anyhow, we talked at great length, and I asked her what she remembered and so on, and she said uh, she remembered the night that I went out in the forest. The reason she remembered is they had a British couple at the house for dinner, and they had a late meal. She said we were just enjoying dinner, when two policemen showed up at the door around 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Apparently, Mel Zickler sent two cops over to tell Gordon Williams something was going on in the forest. She said Gordon got quite excited, and he got on the phone and called somebody. That somebody, I think, was Al Brown, his golfing partner, and probably one of our best pilots in the wing. And apparently, he went up into the control tire acting as a supervisor of flying. Now, that, that would be unusual to have somebody go up there at midnight when we're not flying and to have a command radio. So, but anyhow, that's part, another part of the story. So, I learned a lot more talking to the rest of them. There, obviously, Gordon Williams knew a lot more, but I never found out. Hmm. Now, going back to the, the Jim's book's called The Rendlesham Enigma. Um, I know you and Jim are quite are very close friends, aren't you? You have been for many years. I doubt very much if this is all the factual relationship, but I think you you're you're intending to have a good talk with. Jim. I'm going to have a good talk with Jim and, and have um, him explain. And Gary. No, I I know he he's taken exception to things I've said, but primarily, I've seen the notebook several times and I never saw anything in it that indicates 16 pages of code. Now that doesn't mean he didn't have them and he may have taken them out. We said at one time he took some out all but six pages or something, but he didn't say anything about that for how many years? 25 years or yeah. something. So, and people ask me, what do I think? I say, I have problems with the code. I don't, I, and, but I do say, Jim sincerely believes it and I can't answer. You have to yeah. talk to him. All I know is he says he's, he got the code. Uh, it would be interesting to have him sit down now in a plain room with a sheet of paper and a pencil and see if he can duplicate some of those ones and zeros, if, yeah. if he can still do it. If it was downloaded and he has it planted in his memory, if he could duplicate that, it would be scary to me. Yeah. Obviously, you, you know that he appeared on the show um, well, a few shows back now. And uh, he, he himself said he was the, the whole. Um, it, it scared him, the fact that he was getting yeah. all these ones and zeros coming through his head. And... Uh, he, he really thought he was going crazy. So yeah. that's why he hid those uh, figures. I mean, like you say, he could have torn them out and uh, hid them away. And, uh... Well, then let's talk about a couple other things that I didn't mention because I was walking through. Years later, I learned a whole lot more. A lot of people have come forward, especially the air traffic controllers after they retired. They have gone on record, and I, by the way, I've met them, and they have done signed sword statements. Yeah, you want to stop now for a minute? I'll go. Yeah. Can you stop it? Yeah, I'll go and get you. <clears throat> I'm starting to get... Now, a lot of things have happened over the years. A lot of people have retired. Uh, people have come forward. Uh, it's very interesting. I've learned a whole lot more happened at that time that I didn't know about. For instance, the air traffic controllers at Bentwaters, the two guys up in the control tower, they actually watched the night I was out. They actually watched an object go across their scope at two to 3,000 mile an hour. They watched it go across twice. It came across, went back across. The object approached the control tower, came within good visual distance of the control tower. They saw the glowing reddish-orange object. They watched it go into the forest where I was. Found out later that Eastern Radar had picked up a blip too and it dropped off the scope somewhere near Rendlesham Forest. And even better than that, a uh, member of the uh, Nita's Head, who had air defense responsibility for the area, uh, had an interesting thing. They had the two cameras on their radars that picked up everything. Uh, right after the event, American and British ranking people came, and they confiscated the logs for the cameras. They confiscated the camera tape, and they told the controllers, you didn't see anything. And that's on the record now. Uh, one of their members, Gary Baker, has come forward, and he went back and talked to several of his other fellow controllers, and they all verified yes. So, obviously, all the radars picked up something. Now, more interesting than that, the cops in the weapons storage area, 
The weapon storage area has a large tire. It's 40 or 50 feet tall. It's the alternate control center for the sensors on the fences and the gates and whatnot. And it's the eyes and ears in the sky, so to speak, looking over the weapon storage area. The operator up there actually saw something. Some of the other policemen went up with 12 power binoculars, and they claimed that the bright white lights we saw in the sky that one, for instance, set the beam down, they could see they were triangular in shape. They also claimed to have seen a large, huge mothership and had seen sparks or something equivalent or something dripping or flying off of it. They said it was probably little drones. So, also, civilian people have come forward. Three or four different couples had seen something very similar in the same area. So here we are. We have almost 75 best guest witnesses that saw something that night. Unbelievable. So when someone says they saw, we saw the lighthouse, yeah, we saw the lighthouse, but that's not what we were dealing with. The lighthouse was visible a lot of the t- time we were in the forest. And we got in a high point or some clear point, we could see the lighthouse. Yeah. The lighthouse is interesting. It has three lenses, red, white, and green. Red and green focus the sea and the white the land. If you see the lighthouse from the land, you do not see a red and green light. You see a white light. We saw a red object, not a white object in the, on the ground. So it wasn't the lighthouse. I met the lighthouse keeper and his wife and had a drink with him, talk with him for a long time. The lighthouse is automated. In fact, I think they're going to decommission it now. I can say it's not as bright now as it used to be then. They've, they've dimmed it down or changed the wattage or whatever they do. But it's still there. It was the last time I looked. I was just saying, um, if, if it was the lighthouse, you'd have been getting a lot more UFO reports. Oh, you would, we would have been getting constant <laughs> UFO reports. The cops don't know. I won't say all the cops knew. You know, anybody that worked that area knew the, knew the lighthouse. You, you could see it flashing. It flashed every four, five, or six seconds. Yeah, it was, it was, we were very familiar with the lighthouse. In fact, I, I, I've been out there many times taking visitors out to the castle keep that's still standing. And of the two little pubs out there that have good food at a reasonable price. It was a nice place to take people on, you know, Saturday or Sunday afternoon at Pretty Beach. Nice setting, good food, a little castle to look at or what's left of it. So I'm very familiar with it. Yeah, it's a nice area, isn't it? Um, I think the next question is going to be is about the Jim Peniston went back. And took plaster cast. Oh, you want to talk about the plaster cast? Yeah. yeah, there's some question about the location. Jim Peniston has been back with, with me at least four times, if not more. I think four. I'd have to go back and check the records. But anyhow, we've always gone back to the same place. Uh, up until the last time we were here, we went to a different place, which is way off to the right. And uh, obviously was not where the object was seen or sat on the ground or whatever. But the interesting thing is, when I went out the following day, I took a British friend out that wanted to see it. That was a Tuesday or Wednesday, probably. And I took a 35-millimeter film cassette, because there's little black cases that film used to come in, and scooped up some soil out of the indentations. And uh, my friend also scooped up some. He had his analyzed. And he came back and said, Oh, I know how you made those indentations. You made them. You used plaster. I, he said, you used plaster Paris because I picked up calcium carbonate in the sample. I said, no, let me tell you what happened. Jim left the scene, 5.30, 6 o'clock, went, you know, did his debriefing and went home. And he was nervous and upset and thought for sure, and he, rightly so, that nobody would believe him. So a friend of his landlord or neighbor was a plasterer. So he was talking to him, and the guy said, you know what, I'll give you some plaster of Paris, and you can go out and make plaster casts of those indentations, and you'll have some physical evidence. Jim said, great. So he got a backpack and a jug of water and a bag of plaster of Paris, and he went out and made three plaster casts of the indentation. He signed them, put the date on them, and numbered them one, two, three. So that's the story of the plaster casts. Now, Jim was nervous that they would disappear, and I know he told me he buried, put them in a big plastic bag and buried them in his garden here in Ipswich and left them there for several years. But then he rotated back to the States, and he was afraid something might happen, so he gave me one. He put one in his household goods. Now, when you ship your household goods from the military, coming back from overseas, you put things in small boxes. They inventory a number of them. They put it in a larger box. Then it all goes into a huge shipping crate, which is six or eight feet tall, and about four feet across by about four or five feet. They're nailed shut. 
They're caulked and sealed to protect them from the weather, and they're shipped directly to you, and they open them only in your presence at your new home. Well, Jim's shipment was delayed something like six, eight, ten months, I know, forever and ever, and they had to put tracers on it many times, and it seemed like uh, they couldn't find them, and they finally showed up. When they opened the crate, which was still supposedly sealed, opened the boxes, the plaster cast was gone. Hard to explain. Why would anybody go to that much trouble? I, I don't know. I do know one thing I've learned later. About three-quarters of the thing I was told at the initial investigation, this was a brief thing, uh, by the first three participants that were out the first night and others that were involved on the peripheral, they had all been messed with with drugs and hypnosis. Unbelievable. In fact, the statement that Jim, John, and, Bur and uh, Cabanasac gave me were canned statements they were told in the OSI officers, which you can say. They never told me that till years later. They didn't tell me until years later that they were given drugs and hypnotized. No. Several of them told me they recognized somebody from a photo, and I didn't start this. But the UFO advisor to the White House, a medical doctor with a Ph.D., was involved. He was here. He's known in some circles as a UFO cleanup doctor. He was involved. So, a lot of other people. There's a lot of disinformation. A lot of things have been colored. Uh, recently, I had two people come forward to me. My daughter, who's now almost 50 years old, who was a high school student at the time at Bentwaters, uh, was intimately familiar with the, the incident because I came home and told them. Uh, here she is, you know, 35 years or whatever later. She's in an outdoor store in Manassas, Virginia, buying camping gear. And she asked the clerk at the counter, do you give a military discount? She had been in the military. She'd been in the Army Band in Washington, as is her husband. And they said yes. But the standing beside the clerk was the assistant or store manager. And so he overheard the conversation, and he said to her, were you in the military? And she said, yes. He said, what branch? He said, Army. I was in the Army Band in Washington my whole career. Oh, he said, well, I was in the Air Force. She said, oh. He said, where were you stationed? He said, well, I was initially stationed at RAF Bentwaters in 1979 to 1981 or 1982. She said, Bentwater? She said, my dad was there. What? She said, maybe you know my dad. He said, his name was Colonel Halt. And the guy says, Colonel Halt? Do I remember him? I was out there with him. She said, what? So she gave me his name and number, and uh, I called him up. And at first I was a little suspicious. But no, he knew he knew Bob Sergeant Ball. He knew everybody. He knew the flight schedules. He was right. He had been one of the cops that was left at the gate to guard the weapons whenever I went out into the forest. He was holding the weapons for all the cops that were out there. He and his partner, Smitty. Meantime, Smitty got hold of somebody through the 81st police website where you could go back and look for people that were stationed there with you and made some comments and somebody picked him up i don't remember exactly who david i think you might have been involved yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh they contacted me so i called him up and talked with him and he verified and each of them said smitty said and so did uh, jeff that they both were there and i said to each of them a couple of things i said first of all what did you see and they both told me, we saw the glowing object. We were very frustrated. We wanted to come out and be with you, but we couldn't leave the weapons. Wow. And I said to both of them independently, was Larry Warren there? And they both said the same thing. Are you kidding? Larry Warren wasn't there. They, Larry Warren was a joke. He was a druggie, and they knew it. So going back to Smitty, uh, he says he had a, an earlier experience and that he was guarding the, the, the East Gate with an M60 at some point. Well, I can't, go ahead. I can't say he didn't have an earlier experience because I can tell you that there are so many people that have had experiences going all the way back into the 60s and 70s, military people. In fact, there's one particular case in, I think it was 1972, where the police in the weapons storage area actually opened fire on an object, obviously with no effect. But there are multiple people have had experiences. Many of them, they've come forward to me after this, you know, the incident became public and they knew who I was, they sent stuff to me unsolicited to say, hey, and they give me information. And I've shared a lot of it with Robert Hastings, who wrote the book UFOs and Nukes, and I've passed it all on to him so he can use the material. So, yes, a lot of people had experiences. He may have had an earlier experience. Uh, one of the female cops had something happen earlier in the month 
uh, she rotated like, well, rotated, went back to the States in mid-month, but prior to going back, she apparently saw something similar. But you ask about an M60 machine gun. We did not routinely bring out M60 machine guns. M60 machine guns were only brought out for certain exercises, and then we didn't bring out the belted cartridges. Hey, it's a crew serve weapons. Two yeah. people had to operate. One guy carries the bullets, and one guy carries the gun. Uh, if we had a real world incident, yeah, they'd have been out there. But uh, Sergeant Smith says he had 500 rounds in the, in the weapon. He didn't have 500 rounds in the weapon. He had an M16, which is fully automatic capable. Yes, it's select. You can select. But he didn't have an M60. Yeah. I mean, that just ridiculous. I mean, the story is that he would be been opening fire on the British territory with 500 rounds of uh, with, with a, a, an extremely heavy machine gun, to, uh, which is for... Um, holding off a, a, an attack from Russia or something, isn't it? And, and I think he said somewhere that he chambered around. And Fred, he did yeah. not chamber around on an M60. I mean, I, we I, were very, very careful with the M60. We didn't dare let them get off the base or get anywhere. Anybody could do anything yeah. with them. It's a very lethal weapon. Because I asked a question at the, actually at the museum, and I got a look uh, like with raised eyebrows and something, really? <laughs> you know? But, um, yeah, it's an interesting story. I mean, nobody's querying the fact that he may well have experienced something. I think the, the biggest question was the this uses of this uh, M60 machine gun, which kind of throws into question the other experience. You know, when when someone has to um, ex, uh, sort of en enhance their story with that sort of thing, it's uh, it just throws other things into question, doesn't it? In my mind, anyway. Well, I was able to verify he definitely was at the gate with Jeff Wein Weinshold. Yeah. The night I was out in the forest. I mean, I, I was able to verify that with other people too. So each of them told me the same thing as far as being at the gate independently and both independently said, yeah, that was my partner. And other people in the cop squadron said, yes, that would have been them. Hmm. But also since then, I think over the last, uh, now three years ago, when I first, or three, maybe four years ago, when I first heard of about Smitty, he wasn't giving out these stories that now he's getting, he's getting downloads now. He's well, the problem we're having, there's so many wannabes that may have been on the fringe or may not even been there, and they're all giving Larry Warren some competition, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, I think he's getting on the the, the Jim Peniston bandwagon with the, the downloads. That's what it seems to me. Okay, the next question of Steve Longaro. Now, there's a story that goes around. Steve Longaro was on duty. He was in the Delta. Or, well, okay, Peniston was the supervisor. Yeah. He was nowhere. He could have even seen the WSA or the weapon storage area or the... The, the place in the forest. He was a half a mile or a mile away. Yeah. Well, you said he'd get court-martialed if he'd have left, left his base. His, uh, yeah, or well, if he'd if, if if have left his position, he'd have been court-martialed. Yeah. But the story, there's a story going around. That he well, I, I, there, there's three or four cops that were drinking buddies and maybe, uh, how shall I say, users or whatever with Warren. And I won't mention the other one's name. I'll protect him. But uh, has said, oh, yeah, Larry was out there. He, and then he, a couple of times he said, well, maybe he was out there. Larry has asked many people to lie for him. Uh, even, uh, your, even your buddy we talked about earlier that said, went to him and he said, he asked me to lie and say I was out there. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Now, um, we, I suppose we've got to talk a little bit about Cable Green, the film that's been made. You, you were asked to be part of it, but you refused flatly. Didn't no, you? I didn't. I wasn't asked. That was a different film. Oh, was it? I've been asked to do a half a dozen different films, and I've refused it. I've said, what, I've tell, what I tell everybody is if you give me editorial control. In other words, give me a chance before you release it to make sure it's accurate. And nobody wants to do that, so... Forget it, because I've done programs, and almost every program I've done other than Unsolved Mysteries, they've embellished it or, you know, not told the story correctly and added things, deleted things that are important and made it so it would sell, I guess is the yeah. best word. I mean, the film was basically going to be the Larry Warren story, wasn't it? it came yeah. Out when it first came out, or, or began production, shall we say. Um, uh, we've seen the trailers with Aliens Landing in Cable Green. Which there there were the no farm, aliens. Which was actually the farmer's field, not Cable Green. Nothing landed at Cable Green, <coughs> I understand it. Um, all you saw going over Cable Green was lights. The, the night I was there, nothing landed. The glowing object was right just off the ground, maybe 10 or 15 feet at the most off the ground. But it did not touch the ground that I could tell, mm. and it disappeared. The objects in the sky never landed at that I know of while I was there watching. And there was certainly no aliens in bubbles and things. That's no, I didn't see any bubbles. Around. I kept looking for something strange. I mean, other than what was going on was strange enough and really phenomenal. Mm. It's, um, 
I suppose we ought to leave that alone really and wait and see. We're, we're still waiting to hear when it comes out because it's been delayed by about a year so far, isn't it? So, uh, well, they're going to get a surprise because they may meet some legal people when they put it out. Well, yeah, I know you made a couple of telephone calls, didn't you? Here, yeah, you yeah I've, I've talked to some legal people. Oh. And they, they tell me the same thing. You've got a good case if they use your name. Yeah. I've put them on record for that film. Do not use my name, a likeness, my tape, my memo, or anything that relates to me or refers to me. Yeah. I think Jim's done much the same, isn't he? Jim Penniston's I think Penniston like, did the same thing. And I believe Nick Pope even. Nick, well. Nick, and Nick Pope also has put him on notice that uh, we, we will come after them if they put it out and use us. I mean, I've seen their trailer, and it even has somebody playing, uh, playing me. Oh, yeah. Anyway, um, okay, yeah, let's go back to... Um, Let's go back to the conference now. Now, Sasha Christie got an award, as you as you know, presented by myself. And uh, <laughs> how did you feel about that? Do you think it was well deserved? Oh yes, Sasha. You know, they really beat her up something scandalous. Now here we are, a woman that took Larry Warren in, believed him. In fact, she used to send me some pretty strongly worded emails. You know, yeah. supporting Larry. And it wasn't too long after Larry was there that she figured out what kind of, he's one of the biggest frauds you've ever run into. Hey, I have to tell you, the guy is a very convincing liar. He has a good story for everything, or an excuse for everything. And he's not just into UFO things, he's into sports memorabilia, counterfeiting this, counterfeiting that. He's, he's a big time guy. He would make a good story his life, I tell you. Yeah, we're I mean, not saying anything. You're not saying anything illegal, dear, because there's actual evidence for it. Peter Robbins is actually a victim himself, isn't he? Oh yeah, Peter Robbins, who worked with him for 20, what twenty some years, yeah. and the whole time I was from the first time I met Peter, I've been telling him, Peter, you're on a dying horse and ride it to death. Get off while you can. I have a very, very long, profuse apology from Peter, which he asked me not to share, which I won't, because it's pretty emotional. Yeah. Uh, he feels extremely badly. Peter's not a bad guy. He just, but I do think he he, he, he knew go. he knew for a long time and didn't know how to get out of it. Yeah. He did go through quite a lot of. Um... He he knew he knew Warren. He knew Warren was lying. He knew Larry had a drinking problem. Larry had a drug problem. On and on and on, according to him. Uh, okay, another question. <laughs> The Hulk Two book. When's that coming out? Because uh, it was well, supposed to have been out around about now, wasn't it? With the, I think John's been a bit delayed with certain things. John Hanson. John, John has a whole lot of turmoil in his personal life that has nothing to do with UFOs right now. More to do with the woman, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yeah, it, it'll it'll be out when it gets out. I have no rush. I only wrote the book with him for one reason. That's to get the truth out. There's no intent. I made no money off it. I don't intend to make money off it. If John sells the books, John keeps the profit. I really don't care. I just wanted the whole truth out. And it was written more to be a textbook type thing for people that are very seriously investigating the incident. Yeah. That's why we go through and say, he said this, she said that, and I comment. Yeah, because there was never intended to be a second volume, was there? It's no. just really, I think this is what's happened over the last three three years or so, isn't it? This is kind of an update. That's yeah, a, that's, that's my basic. More's come out. We've learned a whole lot more. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't know until not too long ago that the, the statements I was given initially by the first three people, they were canned statements. They were told what to say and what they couldn't say. And... There's some real issues. For instance, John Burroughs isn't sure what happened in the forest. I'm not sure Jim is 100% sure either. Yeah. Because they've been given, John's been given screen memories and has things blocked. Now, they've been hypnotized multiple times since then. And I know John's diligently talked to people, you know, experts in hypnosis to try and find out. He wants to know what really happened in the forest. Yeah. I don't, he doesn't know. He'll admit that. Yeah. Have you got any plans for the 40th anniversary next year? Or? I don't have any big plans, but I, if, you know, if appropriate, I'm willing to. I'm not doing too many more programs. I'm not excited about doing a movie or anything. I'm, no. You know, that's not. I've got my own life. I put this on the shelf and don't pay any attention to it until somebody asks a question. If it's yeah. a legitimate somebody that's honest and straightforward, I'll answer it. Yeah. If it's some somebody on the fringe with some nonsensical thing or wanting to do a movie that make a lot of money or something, I just tell them no interest. Yeah. I, I, I think that's kind of why I, I, I'd like to get you back over again for next for next year. Hopefully, if we can for the for the fortieth anniversary, maybe even with Jim, if that's a possibility. I, I don't think you I, this book. I don't think it's really caused any real rifts between you, is it? It's just caused um, problems between friends. Maybe I don't know how to put it really. 
How would you well, feel? I'm just very hurt and disappointed with the book, to be very honest with you. Because, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's actually, a lot of it's from Jim, is it, the comments? I think he's actually just put a lot of comments in the book from other people, with you know, different versions of... Um, well, then, then he should say it. Yeah, if if he wasn't there and doesn't know, then he needs to say this is somebody's opinion, or this yeah. is this or this that. And a lot of the there's a lot of quotes in the book, but they're all taken out of context, and many of them are slanted. Mm. They don't tell you know what was going on. They just take a sentence or two. Yeah, sure. Well, I know you'll be talking to him anyway. Won't I you? will. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Well, I imagine that. I, I suppose that that's really we could draw a line under that now, and. Um, I think uh, all I can say is thank you for this this talk, Colonel, and it's lovely to have you back over again, Chuck. Oh, it's um, my pleasure. I um, appreciate I appreciate the invite and all. Yeah. It's been fun, and, and I've met a lot of nice people. Uh, you know, some people I hadn't seen in years, and uh, yeah. others that I'd never met before, and they were, you know. Well, I've got to say, the feedback I've been getting for the conference has been really positive. I mean, it shocked me. I, I thought the whole thing might just go tits up, you know, as, as a British saying. But, um, <laughs> but well, I have I, to tell you, the, the first time I did a, a, a speech over here was years and years and years ago with Harry Harris up in Manchester. And when I didn't know, I walked into a hornet's nest. All Larry Warren's followers who ardently oh, believed right. him were there. And when I said he wasn't there, they about went crazy. I almost right. had to run for my life. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've got to say, at this point, when you mentioned that, I mean, they were invited to the conference, and they and they they could have shown their their, their half of the story. But uh, oh, I would no, love no, to. No. I would love to have had Larry yeah. here. Oh, or or yeah. or Gary Heseltine. Yeah. What what a never mind. Yeah. I have to laugh when I talk in the name of his magazine. I think it's funny. Yeah, the truth. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but anyway, I guess we'll leave it there. Thank you, thank you, Chuck, and um, hopefully we'll see you again next year. I'll, I'll, you know, well, you're you're in my home at the moment, so I'll be seeing you in a minute in the other room. But uh, <laughs> but uh, thanks for coming on, Chuck, and uh, telling us the story and putting us straight on a few things again. And uh, it's been great having you over again. Thank you, and thank you for listening, everybody. <laughs>